All right, morning guys, seven o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone on another freezing cold <laughs> morning. It was not warm out there. Uh, so I know Pete uh, had plans at least generally to go hunting today and I'm glad it fell through because it was way too cold to spend <laughs> hours outside. <laughs> Forget it, we'll wait for a warmer day, right? Uh, but again, I appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to come out on a, on a Saturday morning this early. Let's uh, start with some prayer requests and just some updates. Uh, I know Josh is here. Uh, I know they had uh, a sad event in their family this week. So just, Josh, if you can update us on that, please. Yeah, so uh, yesterday, um, we, uh, Becky's mom, um, they think had a heart attack and passed away. Um, so uh, they don't know a whole lot other than that. Um, Yep. Yeah. I know uh, Becky was very, very close to her mom, too, so I know it's just got to be devastating for her. Uh, that was hard. So we'll be praying for you guys this week. It's, uh, it's going to be a tough week, for, for sure. Um, Scott, I know we had been praying for your friend who had leukemia. Any updates with that? No, he, he's kind of in the getting tests, figuring out where he's okay. at, and then he doesn't have like, a care plan yet. Yeah, so okay. Just... Okay, we'll continue to pray for... Yep, opportunities for you to care for your friend. It's good. Okay. And then uh, let's continue to pray for the Moore family. John's dad uh, was having some breathing problems. And, of course, for their son, that little baby who, boy, what a miraculous story that God's done with that uh, family and, and Abel. So we'll continue to lift him up in prayer, too. And then Al, too, for continued healing. It's another miracle that uh, God did in healing him with the brain surgery and all of that. And uh, I know he's still going for checkups, but... Uh, when he gets back, we'll see if we can get an update from him as well. So anything else, guys, we can be praying about? I, I, I do have an update from, uh, from John. This is uh, from yesterday. Um, he said uh, he's doing better. He was discharged on Tuesday, and his spirits are up, and he, and he has the right mindset to better himself with diet and, more, and being more active. Um, he will be doing dialysis Monday, Wednesday and Fridays. Okay. Yeah, but it sounds like, yeah, he's, he's out of the hospital. Okay, good, good. Thanks, Chris. Anything else, guys, we can be praying about? Steve? Uh, my sister-in-law, she was 20, 21 weeks pregnant. Uh, her water it started leaking yesterday, so she went into the hospital, and they basically said, oh, we can't, we can't do anything. So they, they sent her home. So basically, if you do like, she stays there, she goes into labor and delivers it, and they won't resusc try to do any resuscitation because it's 21 weeks or whatever. Too early, they can't do anything that early. Like a, sure. She's in all, like all the monitoring and everything, showing that the baby's healthy. So. What's her name? Jesse. So that's like news yesterday, so I'm not really even sure where everything's at right now, but. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Okay. Anything else, men? I got one. Uh, my wife and I are fostering four kids, and we're like in the final stretch of adoption, and there's just a lot of unknowns with like court dates and stuff, and so we're hoping there's no surprises, and it's supposed to be done like beginning of April, and it probably would be better for the kids if it was done sooner, because yeah. they, they need to feel some permanency. Yeah, sure. So, so far everything's going all right, but I don't know. So adopting four, and you guys have two? Huh? Yeah. So we've got a six. So the, what's the age range of all six of your kids? In three weeks, when my daughter has a birthday on March 10th, we'll have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Let's pray for our brother, <laughs> our family. Yeah, for sure. The day after is another birthday, and then one times 12, and he ruins it. But. <laughs> <laughs> wait till they're all, one wait till you got like 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. That's coming. <laughs> Actually, a couple months ago, when some of them had birthdays, we had two seven-year-olds, two nine-year-olds, a five- Two sevens, two nines, and eleven. That's all yeah. Kind of yeah. Sure. Well, and yeah. thank, thank you, you for you and your wife being willing to do that for four kids in foster care. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, we'll definitely need to pray for you guys, for sure. All right, let me uh, ask God's blessing on our time together this morning, and let's lift up these prayer requests. Lord, thank you again for the privilege it is to come together, uh, God, every Saturday morning. Lord, I thank you for each man in this room, those who could not be with us this morning. Lord, we want to know more of who you are. You are a great God. You alone are worthy of our praise and our honor, uh, Lord, and our adoration. Lord, thank you for your word. You've revealed us your truth. We see it in your creation. 
Lord, teach us this morning. Open our hearts and our minds to the truth. Lord, challenge us, and Lord, may we draw closer to you. To these requests that we've offered before you, God, you, uh, Lord, we thank you for your sovereignty in everything. We thank you for your sovereignty in our praises and the good and the blessings that you bring to us constantly, Lord. And Lord, uh, Lord, we uh, even, Lord, help, ask for you, help us to persevere and to learn even in trials and challenges. Lord, lift up to you, Becky, who is just devastated at the loss of her mother. Uh, Lord, I just pray you comfort her and the entire Oren family. Uh, God, as they're grieving right now. Lord, we think of uh, the Finks and uh, their... Lord, thank you for blessing them with four beautiful children. But God, that's uh, it's busy. And so we ask that the adoption would go quickly and smoothly, that you would work out, Lord, that that would uh, lessen some of the bureaucracy. Thank you, God, for John's father and the good report that he's out of the hospital. And Lord, we ask for continued uh, uh, peace for uh, Scott's friend, Kelly, Lord, who was diagnosed with leukemia, and that Scott would be able to minister and uh, bring uh, hope to that family as well. Lord, to all these things we lift up to you. Lord, thank you for your sovereignty in all things that we can trust in you fully and faithfully forever. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, guys, uh, we are going to finish chapter 27, Atonement, part two. And uh, next week we'll jump into resurrection and ascension. Remember, we're in part four, the doctrines of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And I want to start with last week. Scott asked a really good question. Did the Jews under the old sacrificial system understand that God was temporarily passing over? Or what do you think was going through a Jewish person's mind when they brought that lamb to sacrifice? Did they understand what that was and that the Messiah was coming that would pay for sins once and for all? I thought that was a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I did go, I did pull this up, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. So Peter writes this, concerning this salvation, now he's going back and talking about all the prophets, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Meaning this, the prophets were searching in intently and they got glimpses of what was to come but didn't have the full clear picture. And then Peter even goes on to say, it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were serving not themselves but you, meaning they understood this, that, they did, that God was doing this work and they may not have had that full picture yet, but understood very clearly that this work and the words they were receiving to prophesy were from God. It was revealed to them they were serving not themselves but you and the things that now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things, I love this last part, things to which the angels long to look into. Even the angels themselves, the Greek word there is they're peering over a balcony and they're seeing this intently, watching this in, with this great interest unfold God's plan of redemption as the angels are in wonder and awe too of what God is doing to redeem us as people. And so I think the answer that my thoughts on this is that they may not have fully understood what that meant and yet the scriptures do say um, Isaiah, we brought this up that uh, last week that uh, the scriptures say that he will be called Wonderful Counselor in that last part of that verse, and Mighty God. And so the scriptures are there if they wanted to see it that talk about this Messiah being God. And so, but yet they didn't have the full picture. So I don't know if they fully understood. Maybe some did. Uh, I'm not sure. The Bible, the Old Testament saints were saved because their faith was credited to them as righteousness. And they were Old Testament saints and believers. And, uh, but that was uh, before Christ's redeeming work on the cross. And so I, I, I'm not sure if they fully understood that or not. But I think this verse does help us to say that uh, they only had glimpses of it. And maybe some did, maybe some did not. Other thoughts or questions on that? So in, uh, I think it's in 1 Samuel 3, when God is dealing with um, the sins of Eli, Okay. He, um, someone comes to him and says the word of God that your house will not be atoned for forever by sacrifice. And so um, I almost feel like there is atonement in the sacrifice because God gave them this method. Even though it would only be temporary, I, I don't know, I struggle with it because God uses that word atonement and he says it won't last forever. Mm -hmm. so, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and look at that because, right, because I'd, I would be I would be hesitant to say that God, Christ that atonement was in the old because Hebrews I think clearly speaks against it. I'd have to go back and look yeah, at that passage. I don't, I don't really know where I yeah. feel, but 
So I don't know what the Jews thought at that time, if they really understood all of what was happening. The prophets understood that they didn't have a full picture, yet they prophesied and knew that they were prophesying. Uh, so I, any, any other thoughts or comments? And that was 1 Samuel 3. Okay. It might be 2, actually. Okay, I'll go take a look at that too. Because Hebrews is fully written to talk about that the insufficiency of that sacrificial system and Christ's work taking away and once and for all making it complete. Okay, but that was a great question you asked, God. Thanks for bringing that up. Table discussion this morning. We've got some uh, newer faces or returning faces. Make sure you introduce yourself. And here's the question, kind of goes back to last week. How is God's love and justice seen in Christ's atonement? How does that realization make us feel in our relationship with Him? I'll let you discuss that for a few minutes. I'll take attendance. Go ahead, guys. Let's just discuss for a few minutes. Okay, let's bring this back together. We talked a lot about the... The first part of that question last week, we talked about God's love and justice as we talked about the necessity, we talked about the nature of the atonement. What, uh, but but feel free to comment on any part of it, but how does this realization, when we look at God's love and justice, how does that make us feel or what does that, uh, what does that do for us in our relationship to Christ? But go ahead, feel free to comment on any part of it. Love and trust, and that, uh, that personal. I mean, it's a it's it's personal, and he knows everything about you, anyways. And um, but to have that um, that that person you can go to for for anything and everything, and um, just to give you uh, a guidance and peace and. And love and kind—I mean, all the fruits of the spirit. And you know, when you need that patience and um, knowing that uh, that there's nobody else that could ever pay the penalty of your sins. Um, you know, they're they're not pardoned by anything you've done or anything um, it, any, anybody else except through Jesus, His Son. Yeah. A painted penalty for for you for you to show you that it's just like wow. Um, yeah, you know, I was just sharing with the guys that, that that song amazing. It's just um, words can't describe the uh, the gratitude um, uh, for what he did for us, and it's like you got nothing to give, and you're worthless. I, I love you so yeah. dearly. It's just, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks, Thanks Chris. Chris. Thank you. Good words. I heard a couple tables again talking about from last week, it's easy to focus on God's love, and certainly that was there in Christ's atoning work. But this is a topic, God's justice, that we, it's a little harder to think about, that many people, many churches, many don't want to think about God's justice, His righteousness and hatred and wrath against sin. And what that means to pour out the face, God's wrath, and it, that's, a, that's a harder topic to discuss. And yet, Chris, you touched on this, and we understand this part of who God is. It makes His love for us even more amazing as the hymn we're going to sing at the end of this. And we think about, in spite of all that, His love is there and that He was willing to sacrifice and pay that penalty. So any other thoughts and comments on this before we jump into our study? So last week, again, we talked about the nature of the atonement. We're going to talk about the extent of the atonement now. And this was a smaller section at the end of the chapter, but uh, I thought it deserved definitely its own week because what we're really jumping into for maybe the first time in our study is, and I really appreciate that Grudem, though he comes from a Reformed perspective, you don't see him, at least up till now, phrase this in terms of Calvinist versus Arminius, and I really appreciate that about him. He just goes to the scriptures. I think he does a good job of presenting other sides and other views on issues fairly and uh, not to be dismissive or condescending. And I think it's a good model for us to follow as, as well. And so when we talk about the extent of the atonement, last week I think there was some really powerful discussion. For me personally, it meant a lot to really look at the scriptures and think about, again, God's love for us. Yet satisfied 
his justice and his holiness and righteousness too in the atonement. So it was very powerful, it was emotional, and how can we not be as followers of Christ when we really think about what Christ's atoning work did for us? So let's talk about the extent of the atonement, and we're gonna talk about words like limited atonement or particular atonement because as Grudem said in the chapter, he doesn't like that word limited because it has a negative connotation, but whatever we call it, or is it general atonement? So here's the questions that are asked. When Christ died on the cross, did he pay for the sins of the entire human race or only for the sins of those who he knew would ultimately be saved? And then the follow-up question is the same, but later in the chapter he writes, did Christ die for the sins of everyone or did he die for the sins of only those who would believe in him? And there is a distinction made that he brings out in this chapter too that the question's not asking did Jesus intend to only die for those who would be saved or did he intend to die for everyone? It's not talking about the purpose. It's talking about the extent, meaning that did Jesus want to die for just his elect or for those who would believe in him or did he want to die? Because Grudem will make the point that the scripture really doesn't make that an emphasis. And so the question becomes is again, so we'll phrase it in this terms, did Christ die for the sins of everyone or did he die for the sins of only those who would believe in him? And this topic will create, there's a lot of disagreement right now in the evangelical church. There's uh, denominational differences in this. If you come from a Methodist or a Wesleyan background, you're gonna have a difference of opinion on, uh, on what Grudem is teaching here from a Reformed perspective and following Arminian tradition to answer this question. As you will, if we talk about the five points of Calvinism or the five articles of remonstrance that were written to be, uh, to written uh, to counteract Calvin's five points. And so for, for today's lesson, we're going to jump into this. And I think it'd be good because we're jumping into one of the major five points of Calvinism or the tulip. And here's the Arminian side that was written afterward, after Calvin by his followers actually to summarize what Arminius thought as kind of a counterbalance to what Calvin taught. But I think it's good to have at least a background of this because We'll see this more and more as we go into the next section with the doctrine of redemption. We're gonna see these issues and talk about election and predestination and what it means for to persevere. And we go to a passage like Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. What does this mean? And we're gonna see some differences. So I wanna see, and I, I think it's good for us, a word of caution. And we're actually gonna read the last paragraph of our book together because I really think he does a great job of summarizing this, presenting what he holds to biblical truth. Yet there's a great paragraph, and because I can't say it better than he did, I think it'd be good for us to read that last paragraph, and we'll do that together. But just a brief history. So we all know 500 years ago we had the Reformation. Uh, there was only one Catholic church, small c. Catholic just means universal. So after the East-West split in the 11th century, we know in the West... We had the Catholic Church, which means universal. For another 500 years, the church continued uh, in the West. And then 500 years ago, a monk named Martin Luther uh, wrote a 95 thesis. There was issues in the church that he disagreed with, indulgences and other things, and thought there needs to be, uh, there needs to be, uh, these things need to be addressed. I'm not sure if Luther meant to start the fire that lit this massive reformation or uh, shining a light on these things, but certainly that is what happened. He also, one thing, he wanted to bring the Bible in the common language of the people because the, no one had, a, the, the German people didn't have the Bible in, no, in their own language. It was always in Latin. You had to go to the mass and he wanted the Bible to be read in the common tongue. And so uh, at the time, the Bible was not fit for the common people, only the church Really, it was a protector of the truth, and by putting it into a, the common language, you were going to open it up to all kinds of issues, and so the church was not supportive of that. And Luther was, was risking his life to do this. He faced the wrath of the church and excommunication and claims of to be an her heretical, and they wanted to execute him if they could find him. There was a lot of politics going on, too, at the time. It's really a fascinating. There's some movies that have been, if you haven't ever read or have seen, seen some of the movies, uh, that have been written uh, or written created. It's worthy of, uh, it's interesting to look at that time. And uh, so out of that came a system of theology, which has been called Reformed Theology, came out of the Reformation. And uh, it was summarized basically in the writings of a man named John Calvin, who wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, two, we have that now in two volumes and two books. And uh, it was summarized, the Reformed position, which again, I. 
I don't like putting human names when we talk about scriptural truth, but it is a way to summarize kind of what Reformed theology. So TULIP, because of the five points of Calvinism, and then we have again, Arminius came on afterwards and refuted some of this, disagreed, and his followers wrote five articles as well, and here they are right here. And so right now, these uh, 500 years later, 400 years later, these uh, disagreements with some of the, the way that Scripture interpreted continue. And it uh, falls into the denominational lines and others. And again, some of you who do come from a Methodist or a Wesleyan background will, will know that uh, as you read through Grudem, you're going to find some points of difference. And I think for the first time now, we're jumping into, because here's the L, a Reformed position would hold to a limited atonement view or particular atonement, where an Arminian view will hold to unlimited atonement or it's general atonement, atonement for everyone. And so we go through this total depravity, both sides would hold the total depravity. Now there's some nuance to that, but both sides would say that we are incapable of our own outside of the miraculous work of Christ, redemptive work to be saved. And I'm, I'm gonna be generalizing here a little bit, but both sides would hold to total depravity, but there's definitely some nuance within total depravity. We talked about that in chapter 24 when we went through sin. Uh, unconditional election is that reform position would hold, again, I'm just quickly generalizing that Christ, God before the beginning of time, chose his elect and who would be saved. Arminians would, would say that uh, no, Christ is different. He used his foreknowledge looking ahead to who would choose him. Therefore, election is based on his foreknowledge looking ahead. He knows who will be saved. Therefore, that's what election is. So there's a, there, that's a pretty big difference, actually, if you start to think about it. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, C today. Irresistible grace is basically, if God calls you, you're going to answer. That's it. It's, it is irresistible. If God calls, we're going to talk about the effectual calling when we get to the next section. When God calls, you're going to answer. I mean, it's not a choice at that point. Prevenient grace is different. When we talked about this in chapter 24, that Christ's work on the cross did away with the original sin, which created the possibility that every single human being had now the choice to choose. Because they're in a state of total depravity, we can't. But the Arminians, so that's a difference as well, is say that no, now everybody has the Christ's atoning work created the possibility for all to be able to choose Christ. So that is offered as a, on the table. Anyone can come now and choose. That's what's called prevenient grace. And then last, perseverance of the saints. Uh, this one, some, if you ever heard someone say, I'm a, I'm a four-point Calvinism, I'm a 3.5-point Calvinism, I really don't like those designations either, but people will say probably this is one a lot of people will struggle with, and also the one we're gonna talk about, limited atonement too. Uh, basically, the reformed position would be that those who are Christ persevere to the end that they're kept, we go back, that no one can snatch them out of my hand. An Arminian view, because it's different, There's, it's conditional, meaning you can, so really the reality is, if you can choose Christ, you certainly as an apostate can unchoose, renounce your faith, and lose your salvation. And again, I'm generalizing here, very, very quickly generalizing, but those are kind of the five points, we'll explain four, we'll get into today's topic, but that's kind of generally where the sides or the lines have been drawn. And it's unfortunate because this has caused a lot of dissension, anger, conflict within the church. And yes, there are differences in views, but I think I just offer, and Grudem offered it too, is we just need to be careful. Um, what I love today is we're gonna sing an amazing hymn at the end of this lesson. Uh, and you know who wrote that? <laughs> Charles Wesley. And uh, he wrote what beautiful words that we have sung in the church for a long time. And uh, I think it's just good to remember that. So I love when Pete put that on there. And uh, I thought, uh, you know, it'd be good. We both were like-minded there. Let's sing that song because what a great and beautiful hymn that Charles Wesley wrote. And Charles Wesley would be fully in this camp over here. Okay, so that is a very quick overview. And I thought it'd be good, even though this section does not bring this up, I thought it'd be worthy at least to bring, these are the issues then. We're gonna, this will become more and more prevalent as we go into our next section when we actually start talking about the different aspects of the doctrine of redemption. And I will say this from just my, just my personal take on this, is our belief on where we fall in this will be heavily weighted on two things. Chapter 16, our, our understanding of God's sovereignty, and then also our understanding of total depravity, human sin. And I think those two issues to have the proper understanding will definitely shape where we land 
and let's just pull tradition outside and where we, I'm just saying own personal study, certainly these sort of little different frameworks for looking and understanding our salvation in the scriptures, that will, that will definitely shape those two issues. Our understanding of our own sin and depravity and where we fall on God's sovereign plan for us, his just his whole entire sovereignty as we studied, I think we spent three weeks in chapter 16. So let me stop there for a moment, just a general overview, questions or comments at this point. Uh, this is just my guess, but as a point of reference, I'd say less than 5% of the American church is truly reformed. 95% falls somewhere outside of truly reformed. That's just a guess. The other thing is, mm -hmm. Charles Wesley, I think, he was much more on the reform side than his brother John. Mm -hmm. John Wesley was totally on okay. the reform yeah. side. I think Charles Wesley might have, might have been more reformed. It must, it must be, be hard, hard to be a Wesley, Wesley. and be reformed <laughs> to have the last name Wesley. <laughs> that probably didn't sit well at Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, good. I don't know what the percentage would be. You may be right on that. I've never actually thought about when we say who's truly, and if truly reformed means that we hold to five points of Calvinism, then you may be right on that. I mean, I remember my dad would say he was a three and a half to four point Calvinism. He was a graduate of Dallas Seminary and that's what he would hold to. And uh, it's, that's where he landed. And, but again, I, I don't like phrasing, I don't like the words Calvinist Arminius. I, I wish, that's why I'm glad Grudem does not phrase it. Now you have to address it because it's part of church history and it does define some of the issues. So it's okay to do that. I just don't prefer to use the human names applied to biblical truth. Yeah. You know, as uh, reading through this, uh, yeah, I was r wrestling with a lot of these. It's like you know, you start reading through the uh, the points of, of Calvinism, kind of reflecting back and, and using it to kind of uh, uh, look at look at your or yourself, your standing, my standing, and um, and it was like you know, I was like, oh, well, I must be a Calvinist then. And it's like, well, no, I don't agree to that, and um, you know, because that. It, it, I, it's it's an awesome study, and um, it, there's so much to gather out of it. And but a, a lot of it seems like it's reserved. Uh, I, I shouldn't say a lot of it. It's like a good, like one third that seems like it's reserved for for God and for for His sovereignty and what He decides. And uh, but as 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 wrestling through a lot of this, um, and uh, the, 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 these terms that were. Um, uh, really, um, you know, uh, I, I guess it, it 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 showed it showed me pictures of um, putting somebody in a certain category, and okay, well, this is who you are, so you can't be this person. It's like it's not. It's not. I mean, there, there's definitely some. Um, uh, 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 right points and wrong points, but then, um, you know, when it comes to the sovereignty of God, it's, uh, you know, some of these points are, are interwoven between each other and that only, only God knows um, that, that, but to understand that from a, from a point that, okay, well, you can, I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 these are difficult things to wrestle with. What, man, what's the danger of an overt focus or, or too much of a focus on this list versus this list or this or and vice versa. What becomes the danger for us? Because what is our purpose here of this study? Exactly. exactly. What came out of the Reformation was sola scriptura because the church at the time also, if you remember, that biblical, that, that truth came from the Pope speaking in his official office of Pope, church tradition, the church fathers, ancient church writings, and the Bible. And because we don't study, again, we're studying, the theolo the theologians help us to understand. This is just teachings that help us to define, help us to, but it should drive us to the scriptures. We don't study Grudem, we don't study Calvin, they drive us back to the scriptures. So it has to be, Chris, what do the scriptures teach? What do the scriptures say? And if we stop right now with Grudem's book, or we stop with the Institutes of Christian Religion, or pick any theology book, then we've erred, and it's become an intellectual study pursuit instead of driving it. That's, Grudem's words are not inspired by God. They're not biblical truth. Neither are any of the church fathers that have written. 
None of them are. And now again, our Catholic friends would disagree wholeheartedly with that. But sola scriptura was one of the founding points coming out of the Reformation that was very different from what has been taught before. And you can see that in the Council of Trent. The Catholic Church held a council after this for about for many years, about 40 years after that. And finally, if you read their findings, it's interesting. You can see these direct refutations from everything that came out of the Reformation. And by the way, the word Protestant really just comes from the word protest, meaning that we were the protesters of the Catholic Church five centuries ago. So that's where we get Protestant now. So Protestant is just basically any denomination that is not Roman Catholic. And so what's happened now is these divisions still are present 500 years later. And really, in my opinion, until the Council of Trent is renounced, it will be, it will be impossible really to unite Protestant and Catholic Church again because those divisions still stand. And there's some pretty big divisions. I, a Catholic the, theologian said, uh, uh, Catholics and Protestants believe in everything and believe in nothing that is similar. So and simultaneously, because so much of our language is so similar, yet so much is different as well. And so anyway, that's a topic for another day. So let's look at the Reformed Calvinist view. I'll say the Reformed view. So here it is. From our human perspective, and I took some of this more directly from Grudem's, from the book this week. From our human perspective, the gospel is offered to all people because only God knows who will be saved or not. So there is a sense that it is offered to all people because here's the reality. When you go to witness to someone, you don't stop and ask them first, let's see now, are you God's elect? Because if you're not, I'm wasting my time here, and I really don't want to have anything to do with you until we figure that piece out first. And we have to be careful of that, because that nowhere, we are told to go and baptize and to make disciples and go out. We don't search for the elect only, correct? That's in God's work to do, not ours. We have to keep that frame of mind. So there is a sense, even from a Reformed view, that it is offered because when we preach the gospel, we don't ask the non-elect or try to figure that out. That's in God's mind. We do not know that. We preach the gospel. God has all that figured out. We have to be careful of that. Uh, if Christ paid for all sins, then, um, then all sins are forgiven. All people are called to repentance. Uh, those for whom God planned to save are those, uh, those for whom God planned to save are those for whom Christ died. Let me then go to a non-reformed view. The gospel is offered freely to all people. And this is what an Arminian would say, for this offer to be genuine, the payment for sins must have already been made and must be actually available for all, all people. Because this is what an Arminian, this would be the main counterpoint they would say, if the atonement's limited, and this is why Grudem doesn't like it, then the gospel's limited too because they're intertwined. And so we're limiting the gospel by saying that Christ died uh, that sins are only for those who would believe in it must be offered more generally to all because they're tying it, then we're limiting the gospel. Now, in practice, I've heard Grudem say that he's a happy, compassionate Calvinist. Why would he say that in those terms? The pros and chosen. The the first say that, to explain that. that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the church that hates Calvin called Calvinists the frozen chosen because they stay in their little groups they they think they're the only ones saved they never share the gospel and and, and there are Calvinist church who have gone down that road it's a terrible thing our job is to proclaim the gospel to yeah. everyone right and so any Calvinist who yeah, there are great stories some guy wants to go be a missionary in Africa and he's begging his church to send him and and the the church council stands up and says, if God wants those people in Africa saved, he'll save them himself. You're staying here. You know, right, right, you don't have to. Right. Yep, that's good. Thank you. So we have to be careful with that. So that's, you can say the, an extreme form of Calvinism is cold and calculating because if we're going to go back to and say, well, you know what, God's got his elect saved, I, I, take, I don't have to do anything because what am I, it doesn't matter anyways. I can sit back. God's got that figure. It becomes, we got to be careful with that. It can be very cold and calculating, and that is not what the scriptures teach. That is a wrong view of what came out of the Reformation, and we had to be careful with that uh, because that is cold. And if you look at Christ, you, that nowhere in scripture is that taught, and we just need to be careful with that. So I always thought it was funny when he said that I'm a happy, compassionate Calvinist. You gotta clarify that. <laughs> I'm not a mean, cold, the frozen, chosen, calculating Calvinist in this. And I think we, and it's, it's, it's a good reminder for us as well. You know, I use this example. I, I liken it to 
when we are commanded to give, and we're commanded to give as Christians, to give to the work of the Lord and to the, through the church in the scriptures, right? Okay, we're commanded to do that. Now, I liken it to this. If I stop tithing, if I stop giving my money to the church, have I thwarted God's plans? Like, oh man, I, I, wait, I was going to use that tithe, God says in heaven. And now look, he didn't give, so... Well, there goes. There goes a few souls that I was going to be saved now that down the street because John didn't give. Oh, he doesn't need my money to do anything. So then why do I give? Why do we give then? We give from our heart. Why? Why do we give? God loves the cheerful giver. Yes, because we're commanded to. And we get to participate. There's lots of reasons why we do it. It's not because God needs my money to do his will. He doesn't need any of our money. Not, even, not a cent of it. I think it's even deeper than that. All the benefit for giving is for us. All the benefit. It, it, it benefits us to give. God doesn't need our money. So it's not, to your point, it's not, I give my money and then God is able to do something with it. We give our money because God blesses us because yeah. of it. And that's the reason. It, it could never be about, because otherwise there'd be a graduated scale about who gave how much. And in God's eyes, you know, Jesus made that very clear with the widow's two mites. And, that, and that's why we give, is because God blesses us right. when, we, when we're obedient right. and not when we're not. Yeah, yeah I, like I like the, the word, word obedient. And we give because God tells us to, and it's good to do what God tells us to, right? So when God tells us to go and make disciples, we go and make disciples. We don't go and search for, try to find a litmus test for who the elect are, or even not bother, because God already did that. So you know what? I can just kind of wash my hands. And we're going to talk about double predestination and all these things when we get to the redemption uh, and in, part, in our next section, but we just need to be careful of that. And it's important to know, like, you're right, God doesn't need our money. But like you were saying, that our money already is his. So the money that we give to him, it already belonged to him. But it helps us to see that, that it, that it, it is, is everything that we have is his in the first place. Yeah. He blesses us with it. Right. right. Yeah, correct. And it's funny. That's, that's why that's the proper attitude in giving enforces that right attitude and saying, hey, I give and I don't wait till the end of the paycheck what's left over. I'm going to give a first fruit because you know what? <laughs> He's given it to me anyway. So I think there's a good correlation to why we also go because God commands us to share the gospel. He's got all of that figured out. I do not. I get the blessing of being a part of what God is doing. Josh? Yeah, I think uh, just to take that conversation back to the beginning of, of talking about uh, uh, Scott's question from last week that did the, did the Jews understand the atonement, right? Uh, the, the, very first, the very first Passover, did they understand what, what was going on? And could God have saved, though, not killed the firstborn of those that, uh, that didn't put blood over their doorposts, that were Jews? Yeah, he could have done that, right? But it was an act... It was another act of obedience, like, I told you to do this, I asked you to do this, this is the consequences if you don't, you know, and, and, and such, right? And uh, a, 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 another thing where God is sovereign over that, he has control over that, and it wasn't just like some blanket thing that went out that's out of his control after he sets it forth, right? And... Uh, um, and yet, he, he requires obedience yeah. within, within, within those acts. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Josh. Josh. The modern church who hesitates to talk about God's justice is going to struggle with the Old Testament. Right. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. In fact, it's probably best you just skip it entirely because God's wrath, and it's, again, that the Bible is whole and complete, and we get a, a great picture of, what the, of God's justice in the Old Testament and why obedience is so important. Good right. words. I Good words. You have to throw the word faith into there too, because if it's just yeah. obedience for the sake of obedience, yeah. you have to have faith that when you right. give God your money, He's going to provide for you the next day. Or yeah. that when you look at the snake in the wilderness, He's going to forgive your yeah. cure you of your poison. It's the faith. Right. Yeah. It's not just I'm going to do it because I'm afraid of you. Right. 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 It's not, not just, just that. Correct. So when my children obey me, I want them to obey me. Yes, I want. Them, at the end of the day, do what I said. Right. But I also want them to obey me because they love me and they care because I'm their father and they want to do it out of respect. That's the ultimate goal, correct? You're absolutely right. Trust, that faith, trust, correct? Yeah. You got it. Yeah. 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 Because, because giving should be that. And this is where, anyways, we're getting off a little bit of track. So let's come back to this. <laughs> we're running out of time. 
All right, so here's some scriptures why, so they speak to this particular atonement. And there's a lot here. I just thought it'd be good, and you can go through the list yourself in the study, and I would do that. Go back and read the scriptures. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, gave himself up for the church, the called out ones, followers of Christ. Uh, others, um, let's see, Romans 8 talks about the elect. He did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all, how will he not also with him graciously see, give us all things, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies the all. Clearly in this context, seems to be talking about the elect, those whom God has chosen, those who will follow Christ. So we're talking about, remember, the atonement applied to, and there's applied to just the ones who will believe who are Christ's followers. Um, let's see, I like, uh, good, we got examples from John and then in Jesus's high priestly prayer in chapter 17. I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And again, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for who? The sheep. Who are the sheep? Going back to John 10, those who know the shepherd's voice. Followers of Christ. We've been studying this in our, in, our small, in our small groups and in the sermon series. So the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. It isn't for everyone, but for his followers. And so um, Ephesians 1, hey, you know what, uh, this, I'll, I'll stop here just because of time. There's lots of verses that speak of this, that Christ dying for his sheep, his followers, his people. Let's go to a, for a, verses that talk about maybe that speak to a perspective from general atonement. In John 1, the next day he saw, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sins of the whole world. And there's verses like this too, for God so loved the world, so it is, the world seems to be more general that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus in John 6, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone, this is right after the feeding of the 5,000 or more than 5,000, anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So then, so another small, there's more. This is just a small example. So you can see where you're reading some verses, well, it seems to point to this, others... Um, I'm going to skip that piece there. Okay, and go to this. So this was, we don't have time for the discussion question, but think about this for a minute. What do we do when we come to a text or a question of scriptures that maybe seems difficult to understand? We discussed this in detail in chapter 6 a long time ago about the clarity of scripture, that the scripture is clear, that we can't understand it. So when we come to this, an issue, it's like, well, I read these verses and it seems to say the whole world. I read others. What do we do with this as, study, as students of the scriptures, followers of Christ? Just think about this for a minute. What do we do when we come to a question like this? And there's others. There are other issues in scripture that are so hard for us to understand. Just think about that for a minute. What do you do personally? In fact, let me just, maybe we can discuss this together. What do you do personally when you're reading the scriptures or just you're looking at and you say, well, it depends. I read this and I think this. Thoughts on that? Pray and wait. Okay. Yep, good. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Pray for what specifically? Uh, clarity, clarification. If he wants me to know that at that time or not, or if he wants me to just wait and ponder on it, usually yep. it pops back up again. It gives you clarity on it. Yeah, yep. to pr absolutely. I, I, I hope, I'm sure we all do that. Before you read the scriptures, we all thank God for truth. Lord, help. we prayed for that this morning. Help me to understand. And it's funny, understanding over time. So I want everybody to think back. If you've been a follower of Christ over the years, have you changed your thoughts on different topics? just based on study, time, reading, interactions, working with, uh, talking with other people, and just uh, even just the uh, empowering of the Spirit. I, I know I, I've changed my thoughts on a lot of things. I've changed my thoughts on end times. I've changed my opinions on even some of the Reformed theological points over the Arminian points. That's not the way that I was raised. Some of you, I know Pete, you would say the same thing. I've changed over time. I've changed my thoughts on divorce and remarriage. A lot of things in the scriptures over the last 20 years that I don't believe I had positions I held and now have changed after time. I think some of you would nod your head and say, yeah, I can. So I, I put this slide up from chapter six. So we talked about the clarity of scripture. 
means that the Bible is written in such a way that it is able to be understood, but right understanding requires, I thought this was interesting, we talked about this, time, efforts, the use of ordinary means, a willingness to obey, and the help of the Spirit, and our understanding will remain imperfect in this lifetime, that maybe we won't fully understand everything in this lifetime. Yeah. What, what I do is, first off, I think scripture is really important to be taken in context. And so when I find a passage that I just, I, I'm like, I don't get that. I try to take that passage and then read even a chapter or two around that because many times that helps define the context the verse is written in. And then we have the great advantage of having multiple commentaries and Bibles and you know, electronic devices that give you tons of references. And right. my brother coming out of Bible college would say, one of the things they always taught us is that some scripture is clearer than others. And so if you can find associated passages that are clearer, that's where to go look. And, and that clearer passage can help define less clear passages to become a more holistic view, which is again, back to why my views changed over time, is as I've learned to read the Bible more, and to really dig, as opposed to just like having it be a checkbox that I do every day and really dig, that's where I get clarity, is when I do the effort to go really look and really search out multiple views so I can come back with a view that makes sense to me uh, because other scripture you know, supports it or because there's other people who've done more research that can help me understand exactly why that fits in the context for which it was written, even in the time with which it was written. Right, right. and that's why. I like the words using time, effort, and I remember help of the Spirit. We're praying. God gives generously at all when we ask for wisdom. Lord, please help me to understand this. And I love the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture we studied too, that every word of the Bible is exactly the way God in His sovereignty intended it to be. And so we could say, you know, I wish God you would have given us a little more. At the end times, I wish you, is there a missing chapter somewhere in Revelation that we didn't get? No, is we have exactly what we were meant to have. Here. On the subject of atonement, you know, the idea of a limited atonement seems to indicate a, a, you know, some specialness about certain people. And if you just take the New Testament, you know, the other side is really easy. But if you, if you look at the Old Testament, I mean, the Old Testament is so clear that there is a specialness about certain people. I mean, that's what, that's what they are. They're God's people, the Jews. So if you, if you try to incorporate the whole of Scripture, even though you can't explain why certain people are special, it seems like God has certain decisions that he makes based totally on his own, you know. Yeah. And, and God, God gets, gets to, to do that. And God gets to do that. He's God. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And all of his, what he does is good, whether we understand it or not. And we can trust in that too. We can, uh, he is faithful in all those things we've talked about. Okay, so we need to land the plane on this. So let's do this. Here's some points of agreement, general points of agreement. We know that wherever side we fall on this issue, that not all are going to be saved. And both Arminians and Calvinists will say that. Uh, a free offer of the gospel is to be made to all people. Now, there may be some different reasons behind that, but we will all say that when we go, we will present the gospel. We are seeking to make disciples and preach the gospel to all nations. We're not just preaching to the elect and trying to figure out who that is because we cannot. That's God's, that's God's, God does that, not us. And Christ's sufferings are sufficient to merit salvation for all those who God decrees should be saved. Even our, both Arminians and Calvin's, Calvinists would hold to this. The question then is, did Christ die back to the question we started with for the sins of everyone or did he die for the sins of only those who would believe in him? That's the Arminian statement and that would be the Reformed or Calvinist statement on the, on the, on the bottom. But generally there we do have some points of agreement as well. Now, both sides have fired cannon shots towards the other and some of them, unfortunately, because we do have with the frozen chosen, we do have those who have taken this really to a place I would say is not wise, not biblical, not compassionate, but both sides have taken some extreme views and put easy targets for the other side to say, really, there we go. And so, but we need to be careful with that, that we're not doing the same. And here's some points of caution. So again, Grudem brings this up. We should not focus on the purpose of the atonement. Did Christ, and it was his purpose to only die 
for, for the elect or for his, or was his purpose to offer salvation and atonement to everyone? The Calvinists would say God only died to save the elect. The Arminian would say God died for all people, but the work was frustrated by man's rebellion. And you can see by taking either of these two to an extreme, you're going to come to an unbiblical, I would say unhealthy place. And so we just want to be careful with that because and we've already talked about that as well. And as a Calvinist, you would say, all right, the work was frustrated by man's rebellion. We, we hesitate to put anything that man did into the equation when it comes to our salvation. But more on that when we get to the doctrine of redemption. And we should be careful not to criticize an evangelist or a preacher or a teacher who stands up to an audience and says, Christ died for your sins. Because if we're going to even tell, we had to be, that goes back to what is our commandment? Our commandment is to preach to the gospel. There is a sense that their gospel is offered to the whole world. It is offered to everyone. And because here's where we think the, the following two statements can both be stated. Christ died only for those who would believe in him, and Christ died to bring the free offer of the gospel to all people. So let's, and there may be some of us here in this room that might disagree with some of the wording of this, but there is a sense where we can say, yes, the gospel, you can stand before a room and say, Christ died for your sins. Because we wouldn't say, if you're an elect in this room, Christ died for you. the rest of you, you're out of luck. And so you probably just just leave right now because you're wasting your time here. In fact, you're, you're going to be you're dead in your trespasses and going to burn in hell anyways. So you're wasting our time. Just leave. But we say now it sounds dumb to say that, but we got to be careful. We can stand and say Christ died for your sins because that free God offer the gospel is for all people. God's got that figured out. We do not. We must be obedient like the giving, we act in faith and obedience. We must do the same because that's for the Lord. Let me stop here for a second because we definitely want to sing, but I think this may be a good place to land the plane. We're not going to get to the last paragraph, but that's okay. Questions or comments? Let's stop with this then. A balanced pastoral perspective, this is Grudem's quote, would seem to say, that this teaching of particular redemption or limited atonement seems to us to be true, that it gives logical consistency to our theological system and that it can be helpful in assuring people of Christ's love for them individually and the completeness of his redemptive work. And so this is where Grudem would land. Uh, I would encourage you, we're not going to have the time to do it. Go read the, if you didn't read the book, go and read that last paragraph. It's really well done and a caution for us. It's a great summary and a caution for us to be careful as well that we are not adding, that we are not straying to the frozen chosen side as this position as well. And that we need to be careful that the scriptures and what Grudem is going to tell us, and I think he's right, the scriptures do not elevate this to a major doctrine, this issue we've just talked about, to a major doctrinal issue. Some of this where we fall in limited atonement is because it fits better with our understanding of what we would call Reformed theology as well. And so, so when Grudem says, I think he used, there we get, it's consistency to our theological system. There is a point where this fits. And again, when we talk about our understanding of total depravity, God's sovereignty, therefore this fits, it does. It does fit well into the Reformed position. And so to make a, a bigger theological issue of it than it maybe should be is not, is not wise. So let me, I put this, this is John Newton, the former slave trader. I think this is good too. And this, he wrote amazing, the words to amazing grace. But he says, remember when it talks about this war between the Calvinists and the Arminians, that someday we're going to be with our brothers, Charles Wesley in heaven. And it will be, and then there they will be dearer to us than the, than the most earnest friend you have on earth is to you now. And so what his appeal is, just remember, we got to be careful what we allow to divide us here. And yes, there are some divisions in beliefs and practice. We know sometimes it can get messy, but just to remember, I think that's a really good perspective to have. And I appreciate John Newton's words on this. So we'll wrap it up with that. Any final thoughts and questions? Because we want to sing our hymn. I hope we've provided some clarity to this issue because it's hard. It is a, it's a difficult one to understand that has been divisive. But again, so as the whole Arminian versus reformed Calvinist throughout the last 500 years as well. And I'm glad 
that authors like Grudem are calling us as followers of Christ to rise above that, yet go back to the biblical truth and, uh, and stand on that. All right, let's go sing our song. Pete, let me find this a minute. Those are questions. Next week, we'll do uh, chapter 28, the resurrection and ascension of Christ. And uh, Pete, why don't you lead us in this song, please? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be? Thou, my God, should die for me. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. Empty himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free. Oh, my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Good words, men, written by Charlie Wesley. When we talk about the atonement, this is what we walk away from right there. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Your love's amazing. How can it be where we are that Jesus died for us? That is his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. Um, Micah, would you close us in prayer, please? Father, thank you for the morning um, that we got to have. Lord, I pray that it was time um, of glorifying you and worshiping you. Lord, I pray that um, we all grew a little bit more closer to you, closer to our understanding of you. Lord, of course, we know we are so infinitely far away from fully understanding you. But I pray, Lord, that this is our desire to continue to try to grow closer to you. Um, Lord, as we try to wrestle and grapple with fully understanding who and uh, what the purpose or the intent or whatever those words might be, Lord, we just thank you that you did send your son Jesus for us. And Lord, that you offer that to us, um, Lord, that uh, we might not have to uh, worry about that eternal punishment, Lord, but that if we trust in your, your Son, Jesus, um, that we can uh, spend eternity with you. So, Lord, I pray that that is the focus of our hearts, and that is the focus of our hearts as we go to our friends, to our family, to our work, Lord, that we would want them to experience that joy and freedom as well. Lord, I pray that you would keep us all safe as we go to and from um, here and that you would bring us all safely back next week. So in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Micah. Have a great week, guys. Chapter 28 next week.